Uh, first of all, we're going to have a talk from Evrensel Sebet. Evrensel is a first year PhD student in the philosophy department at Bill Kent University. Prior to coming to Bill Kent, he has an MA from the University of Bristol in philosophy, and prior to that, a BA in um, history and philosophy from uh, Newcastle University. Um, and he's going to be talking about democratic states as collective agents. Okay, so I want to start my talk with a background assumption. Um, so the for this for, the, for this talk, I'm going to be assuming that democratic states are collective moral agents. And you might now be thinking that I just assumed my title, but this is, I mean, that's true in a way, but this is not the end of the talk because I want to instead focus on what follows if we accept this claim. So I want to focus on the question of who is, a, who is part of a democratic states agency. And Holly Lawford Smith in her book that came out in 2019, um, tried to answer this question. And she identifies two state models, the citizen inclusive state and the citizen exclusive state. And then to see which model better answers the question, she tests them on whether they satisfy the requirements of different creative agency accounts, which she sorts into um, the categories of strong, moderate, and weak. And she argues that to count as their collective agent, the models should satisfy either the strong or the moderate accounts. And that's why I'm going to be focusing only on those two in this talk as well. Um, so I will begin with an exposition of Lofa Smith's account and explain what the models entail and whether they satisfy the requirements. And then I will offer my own account. So I believe that answering the main question is a fundamental step in determining who is culpable for the actions of a state. But in this talk, I won't discuss culpability, but focus on the question instead, because I feel like discussing culpability is in a way the next step in the project. But I'll be happy to answer any questions regarding culpability in the Q&A. Um, so first of all, the citizen exclusive state model, um, as the name suggests, it excludes citizens from the state agency and it construes the state as the government. So by the national government, the national government includes the executive, legislative, judiciary branches, the police, the bureaucratic administration, and all office holders and public servants that occupy and run these institutions. Lofer Smith calls this the interactor model because these different branches and institutions work together in an overarching cooperative structure. And this allows the state to act as a rational intentional actor. So on whether this model is a collective agent, um, Lofer Smith says yes. And she believes that it's a strong collective agent as well for because it satisfies these three conditions. So there are procedures in place with this model with the government in a way. And these were set up when the state itself was set up. So in the US set up by the founding fathers who drew up a constitution and set up these different institutions. And when members who joined government by accepting a job or by being elected to office, when they yeah, joined the government, they agreed to these procedures and then they intend to perform the acts jointly. And this ensures that there's ongoing collective action with joint intentions. Um, the second condition is autonomy which is met by this model because the group beliefs come apart from the private beliefs of individuals. So there is a large number of people who occupy the government and they act um, within the employment roles, at least most of them. Um, and they also act in an impartial way in their roles. Therefore, they don't reflect their personal beliefs. And this ensures that the group belief is distinct from the, um, the individual members' beliefs or the employees' beliefs. Um, and lastly, the rationality condition is met because this um, group agent, agent can um, has the capacity to change beliefs in order to maintain consistency. So if there's a belief that challenges their previous made belief because it like directly contradicts it, then the government can um, make policy recommendations, set up committees and recognize inconsistency and resolve it. 
And I should say that I agree with um, Lofa Smith that this model is a, does satisfy the conditions of, is a strong collective agent. And so we don't disagree at this point. Um, regarding the citizen, so now the citizen inclusive state model, it is, it also includes citizens. So there's government, but we also include the citizens within the state agency. And this is constituted by all citizens with the right to vote. And whether it's a collective agent, this time Lofer Smith says no, it's neither a strong or a moderate, nor a moderate um, collective agent. Oh, sorry. Um, and she gives some reasons for this. So if, if you focus first on a structure approach, there is no, there is only coordinating infrastructure available for citizens to vote to get in an election, but there isn't any coordinating infrastructure for them to engage and act together in general. So um, they are not coordinated in their other actions. So because their only joint action with interconnected intentions is working together, this is not as a whole group, this is not enough because they should be ongoing collective agency. And then moving on to an intentional approach of understanding group agents, um, which involves the citizens um, jointly intending or jointly committing to the groups, the um, state's goals and procedures. Lawford Smith argues that citizens can't express their joint acceptance of the state's belief or intention. So in other, some other groups remaining silent might express tacit agreement, but here um, citizens lack of protest, for instance, might result from other commitments or maybe due to their lack of belief um, in the effectiveness of protesting. And even if a citizen wants to refuse a state, state um, refuse the belief or intention of a state, other citizens are usually not receptive to argument because of poor deliberative processes. And citizens' only commitment as a whole is towards weak propositions such as commitments to democracy or to the rule of law, but even these are not committed under the conditions of common knowledge. And he, she argues that in states, it's only subgroups such as political parties, non-government organizations and pressure groups that satisfy these conditions. Um, so according to Lawford Smith, then the, the question of who makes the state agency is the answer is the government. And this is where I disagree from um, Lawford Smith because I want to argue that the citizen inclusive state model is, an, is actually a moderate collective agent and the citizens are actually part of the state agency. And I want to argue for this through um, using first a structure understanding, and then I want to support this further by elements from an intentional account of Margaret Gerbit's intentional account. So in a way I'll be offering both a top-down approach and a bottom-up approach of how citizens constitute a collective agent. So first I should explain what the structure, Peter, I'll be using Peter French structure account and French um, um, has written this uh, because, um, to apply for corporations. So he wants to argue that corporations are non-eliminatable agents, so they're agents in their own right. And that, um, so they're independent from the members or the employees that constitute the corporation, there's an independent corporate agent. And this is made possible by the corporation's internal decision structure, its CID structure. And this has two elements. The first one is an organizational or responsibility flowchart that delineates stations and levels within the corporate power structure. So it outlines the roles and responsibilities of different um, employees or members, and then it authorizes certain decision-making procedures. And the second one is the corporate decision recognition role, which is usually embedded in something called the corporation policy. And this states the corporation's fundamental principles, goals, and plans in order to ensure that a decision that has been made is consistent with um, these um, principles and plans, basically. Um, so these two elements together allow those who occupy various stations on the organizational charts to make decisions for corporate reasons that are consistent with the corporate policy. And if any decision or belief um, sidesteps or violate the policy, then they cannot really be described as those of the corporation. So I believe there's something similar in democratic states to the um, CID structure. 
and that's the constitution. And the constitution also has two elements. Um, it outlines the state's decision-making structure, the separation of powers, um, the roles and responsibilities of office holders, but it also outlines the citizens' right to vote, their right to um, engage in joint activity, uh, political activities, and their duty to pay taxes. Um, it also states the fundamental aims and principles of a state. So it states the state's, um, the state's commitment to the constitution itself, to core democratic principles and rights, and to the principle of representative government. So the constitution licenses the redescription of the actions of office holders and, and public servants as those of the government, but it also licenses, licenses the redescription of individual citizens' action, actions as those of citizens as a collective agent. And it is important to note that this, again, as I said, this is a top-down approach, that it, but which ensures a structured unity. And um, yeah, this is this sort of unity, uh, structured unity, is important because of the size of the citizens as a group, and to ensure that the group continues even when the members change. Um, yeah, I believe the constitution has an important. Um, function in giving citizens collective obligations, and it follows from these factors. So the constitution gives citizens the right to vote, and this gives citizens the right to choose their government. So it is the citizens' vote that um, gives the government the right to govern. And I believe this gives citizens control over the government, so they have the capacity to influence government decisions and actions, because if the government acts against the best interests of the people, then the citizens actually have the capacity and the power to vote the government out of office. And I believe it follows from this that citizens have an obligation in a democratic system to supervise the government and to express their satisfaction or dissatisfaction in elections or by protesting or by deliberating with each other. And this is important because I want to, here I want to argue that citizens actually have an active role similar to the office holders and public servants in a democratic system. And I should also um, highlight here, so, so far I've only discussed um, both Law for Smith does this, and I agree with her, so I continue from that, that we only count citizens with the right to vote as part of the state agent. And so, but there's also um, long-term residents and there's without the voting right, and there's also citizens under the voting age who can't yet vote in elections. And, and I don't want to deny that these um, groups have important causal contributions to the democratic processes and to decision making of the state as well. But I believe that if we also accept them, then um, we would in a way would have to, it would like open the doors to accepting other states or even non-government organizations such as the United Nations to the state's agency because those also um, influence state actions and decisions in a way, beliefs. Um, so the right to vote allows us to make a principal distinction in that sense. And secondly, I believe the right to vote is a special status because it is the right to vote that ensures that give the citizens the power and the capacity to influence government decisions, and also what makes the government sensitive to citizen demands. Because if there were no elections and if the citizens did not have the right to vote, then the government could just go on and act on its own, on its own, in its own right. Um, so so far, I've only outlined the roles and responsibilities and how I see citizens as part of a democratic system. But I should also. Um, highlight how they actually do engage in ongoing collective agency because that was one of the worries of Law for Smith. So citizens should not only engage in one of shared actions such as voting in elections, but their agency should continue. Um, so Law for Smith argues that only joint action by citizens is voting elections. And after that, all the work is contracted to direct the government which acts in its own will. And she further explains this with an analogy of hiring a lawyer. So she says that the, after the hiring process, the role of the lawyer is to represent her client's interest in accordance with the law. And she argues that the relationship between the citizens and the government is meant to work the same way. 
So the role of the government is to represent certain of its electors' interests. And she accepts that this is the case with direct commission. So when citizens vote in a referendum to commission the government uh, to take a particular action, then the government usually has to um, comply with this. But she says that with indirect commissions, such as electing a government, the government can go on to act in its own right after being elected. And she gives the example of how politicians famously break their election promises. So the British politician Nick Clegg, who at the time was the leader of the um, Liberal Democratic Party, um, have promised in the 2010 election period not to raise university fees, but he did not fulfill this promise and the uh, university fees in the UK has increased um, from a lot from that date. And so, yeah, she gives the example to just argue that here, and like you can see politicians not um, fulfilling their promises and going to act in the way they want. But I believe there is a different way of looking into the analogy. And I believe the Nick Clegg case can also be studied in more detail. So first of all, um, I believe that after the hiring process, the client becomes receptive um, to the lawyer's action to ensure he performs the task adequately. And if the client is not satisfied with the service he's receiving from the lawyer, then he takes some actions such as firing the lawyer or just talking with them or just like expressing his or her dissatisfaction. And I believe similarly after citizens vote in elections, they remain receptive to how the government tax, whether they fulfill the action promises, and again, take action if they are dissatisfied by protesting or not voting for them again. So the Nick Clegg case in more detail gives empirical support of how citizens do take action if they are not satisfied. So um, it is important to further add then that the Liberal Democrats have lost 15.1% of their votes following the 2015 election, in the following 2015 election, following the 2010 election. Um, Nick Clegg resigned from his position as the party leader for following the same election. And Nick Clegg has also lost his position as a member of the parliament in the 2017 general elections. And here you can see Nick Clegg looking a bit disappointed. Um, so I believe all these point towards some sort of a sort of an editorial control by the citizens. So think about it in a way how the editors of a newspaper exercise control over the would be authors. So, um, so how they how they exercise control over journalists who are trying to publish stuff in the newspaper, and they don't usually intervene in the publishing process of journalists, but because they can, the authors, the journalists have to meet, they try to meet the required standards in order to avoid intervention. And sometimes editors usually do intervene as well, and they can reject the piece, ask the journalist to amend it, or enter into some sort of a negotiation. And I believe we see a similar thing with citizens, such that they don't usually intervene in the state's decisions, but remain receptive to them. And the elected officials and parties who are aware of this control have to remain sensitive to citizens' beliefs and desires and demands, and or they risk not being um, re-elected. Um, and as I shown the Nick Clegg example, I believe shows this um, nicely. Um, so, what, so in this sense, I believe the citizens exercise long-term wide control over state's decisions. And this editorial control and their activities between elections ensure that it links different elections together. So I don't think it's accurate to see elections as very independent events that do not have any links between them. And it ensures that the citizens' activities, the collective agency of citizens, persist between the elections as well. And a good example, another good example is your opinion polls, because these are a very, in a way, passive way of citizens expressing their um, ideas to the government because they just have to answer a few questions. But those, the results from opinion polls, when the collective results that come out from opinion polls, can really make the government or different political parties shape their policies and um, think back on some of their decisions or, yeah, make some amendments maybe. Um, another problem is that Lofa Simit argued was that citizens do not act as a whole, but it's only subgroups of citizens who do so. And so they attend protests and want to political parties or non-government organizations. Um, so I don't see this as a very, in a way, 
a devastating problem because I believe that the joint actions of citizens in subgroups actually have important communicative function that contribute to decision making of the larger collective. So when citizens, um, in a way, protest or they bring something to the other's attention in social media or they debate with each other, all of these is actually has an expressive function that they are important for providing the other, the larger group with reasons on why they should um, vote or not vote for a certain party. And I think these all come together in elections um, in shaping the um, the decision making of the um, citizens. So I think the the role of the subgroups are very important, but it is not accurate to just describe them as very independent of the citizens as a larger collective. Because again, as I said, um, um, I was going to offer an analogy with Margaret Gibbs Poetry Club, but I don't think I have much time, so I'm going to avoid doing that. <laughs> um, so, I mean, but just as a, maybe I can make a more general point. I believe in many group agents, there's substantial work carried out by a subgroup of individuals that contribute to the collective action. And citizens as a group need, don't need to be any different. So not all of them have to engage in joint action, but the actions of different smaller groups contribute to their collective action. Um, and lastly, so, um, so um, this is from um, Margaret Gerber's discussion of intentional action, intentional um, approach towards um, collective agency. So Margaret Gerber argues that group commitments, the joint commitments of group create obligations for members to act appropriately to the joint really accepted belief. And so this means that the members should not go on to act on their own right, but respect the joint made decision. And even if they're going to speak against the belief, they should do so in personal terms. And, and the other members of the group have in, are entitled to rebuke those, to criticize those who act against group commitments. And I think we see a similar thing with um, citizens, such that if other citizens, some um, subgroup of individual citizens um, uh, act against group commitments, so act in a way that goes against democratic principles, then other citizens are entitled to rebuke them in order to reinforce their collective commitments. And I think this comes in two forms, which I'm going to explain by two examples. So the first form is by, um, is in a citizen-citizen sort of relationship. So if a group of individuals such as the mob that stormed the US Capitol engage in an action that threatens um, democratic principles and the group commitments that are stated in the constitution, then they are rebuked by other citizens who, for not act, for acting against democratic principles and for not respecting their um, the rules that bind them all. And secondly, the um, citizens um, can also rebuke the government for not acting in their name. And this has happened in a not in our name protest, which also shapes the name of Law for Um and I think the important point here is that the citizens rebuke the government for not acting in their name, despite having an obligation to do so. So the entitlement, the, the strongness of the entitlement arises because there is an obligation to do something and they're not doing it. And that gives the citizens the right and the, the power in order to intervene and say that this is not what we demand on what. Um, because if there were no obligations, then the entitlement would be quite, uh, the rebuke would be quite weak as well. Um, so, I mean, as you remember, I argued that lawful submit, I that citizens have, cannot express joint acceptance to a state's belief, or they have no means of letting a belief stand as a state. But I believe even if they do not come in a way jointly accept this, um, um, yeah, they cannot express this through joint acceptance, I believe what they do in these sort of instances, such as rebuking the others and um, criticizing the government, do express um, their joint commitment. So it's their actions that do shape um, show us that they're actually jointly committed to the um, democratic principles and the commitments and so on. Um, so yeah, and 
to conclude, I have argued that the constitution gives citizens um, duties and obligations and that so that they have an active role in democratic um, in a democratic system. Citizens do fulfill these obligations because they remain receptive to government actions and they take action in, in a way that um, parallels editorial control. And the activities of citizens in such groups have communicative function, so they allow the larger group to reach decisions. Citizens are jointly committed to democratic principles, which is seen in their actions. And all of these, I believe, show that the citizen inclusive state fulfills the requirement of a moderate corrective agent, and the citizens are part of the state agency. Thank you.